Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop here at chess.com. I'm an international chess coach for beginners and intermediate players, and I can help you improve your game by reviewing the games of masters as well as your own games. The master games to learn the lessons they teach us and your games to learn from your mistakes. Well, speaking of mistakes, Yuri Kotkov has just played Queen D8, and this is the position of today's daily puzzle. And um, if you haven't seen it yet, you're free to pause it here or we'll come back to this position in a little bit. Uh, let's go ahead and tell the story behind this position and how it was reached. Well, in 1957, the 17th RSFSR Championship was being played. Now, let me go back even a little further than that. When the Soviet Union formed, along came the USSR Chess Championships to um, settle national championship status. But the Russian chess championship continued to exist under the auspices of the RSFSR, which is the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic. Uh, in fact, the, two, the first two USSR championships coincided and were recognized as RSFSR championships. Those were in 1920 and 1923. They, they did double duty. Then the Soviet championship split off and became its own thing. But those first two RSFSR championships or Russian championships were in 1920 and 1923. And that's where the numbering began. And now we come to the 17th RSFSR championship held at Krasnodar in May 1957. Krasnodar is a city that stands on the Kuban River in southern Russia, and the city is approximately 100 miles north and slightly west of Sochi, and I'm sure you're familiar with Sochi. Sochi sits right on the Black Sea. Uh, so there's your geography, there's your background, Nezhmedinov lived from December 15, 1912 to June 3, 1974. Um, a writer in chess, a near grandmaster, missed becoming a grandmaster literally by half a point in tournament performance, and so never made the title, although many have strongly suggested he should be awarded the GM title posthumously. and uh, But he is quite the brilliant tactician and um, quite an exciting player to watch. He actually won the RSFSR championship on five occasions, 1950, 51, 53, this year 57, and the following year 58. His opponent is Yuri Kutkov, who was born May 31st, 1930, passed away in 1998, and um, Kutkov not nearly as strong as Nezhmetinov, uh, but he was a master um, as of 1955, and he did hold the International Master of Correspondence Chess, uh, and uh, also an author. He wrote a book entitled The Middle Game, The Defense Triumphs. So these are the players, that's the setting, and off we're going to go as we take a look at this game, beginning with e4 by Nizhmetinov, and we have e5, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop b5, the Ray Lopez opening. Knight f6, the Berlin defense, and we have castles. And that brings us to a Rio gambit. Rio, uh, Ercole del Rio, was an Italian master way back in the 1700s. So this is Rio's gambit accepted. Rook e1 hits the knight. Knight retreats to d6. 
And in this line, Yezhmetinov plays Knight Takes the Pawn. I always like to take this knight first myself. Um, but the most common move is Knight Takes the Pawn by far. I like to play a road somewhat less traveled, quite a bit less traveled, to be honest. Anyway, knight takes the pawn and bishop to e7, obstructing the e-file. The whole point here is you do not want to uh, take this. You could. You could take the knight. It is a book move. I didn't realize that it was actually a book move. Hmm. And after rook takes, then you block with the bishop. Okay. So, anyhow, let's come back. Uh, the what, what happened in this game was Kutkov went ahead with bishop e7 right away, and Yezhmetinov with bishop b uh, d3. Quite an unusual looking move, but obviously it um, is attacking the h man and has some ideas of perhaps super attacking the h-man. Uh, Kutkov castled here. Normally we capture the knight first and then castle after rook takes. And um, then we castle. And then you have knight c3 and c6. Is the book line. Kutkov goes ahead and castles first which gets an inaccuracy from the bot. Knight c3, knight takes, knight, rook takes, knight, bishop f6. And that immediately puts the question to the rook, rook e3. And again, this rook would love to super attack that h-man. By the way, you don't want to get cute and say, I'll play queen here because I'm threatening checkmate because it's going to be refuted by g6 and now both your queen and your rook are on priest and so you're losing your rook for a bishop in that line and that's not a very pleasant situation not to mention this rook's coming over isn't it and so Avoid that kind of stuff. A lot of times beginners will play these cheap, cheap um, well, one-move wonders, I call them. But uh, they are often unsound. So rook e3 is the right way to go. Now g6 and queen f3. And bishop g7. Really thought bishop d4 would be a good way to keep this game interesting. Hit the rook, right? And now you've got to make a decision. Uh, rook e2, perhaps. You know, you've got to answer this. I do get a thumbs up for that choice from the bot. But bishop g7, not liked by the bot. The bot preferring knight to e8, which I, I really don't understand that move. So b3 now. Knight e8 now. What's the purpose of knight e8? Just to get out of the way of the pawn? Or well, I guess you could play pawn and fork. Okay. Bishop a3 hits the rook. And of course, you know, your, your uh, queen's also trapped, so I wouldn't even have to take the rook in this position if, it, if I could take two moves in a row. Bishop e7 would be even more lethal. So d6 to block that. And Nizhmedinov doubles his rooks on the open E file. A good habit for you to get into. Double your rooks on the open file. 
Knight f6 with the threat of knight g4. Interesting, the bot calling for rook b8. I'm not sure. Well, I, I gather so that when you bring out your bishop, the queen can't go pawn hunting, I suppose. Anyway, h3 to prevent knight g4. And white has good play in spite of the fact that the bot is calling for bishop c4 there. So he puts his knight back on d7. Here for sure, I, I see the point now. You want to bring your bishop out, so put your rook on b8. Um, yeah, and the bot concurs with that. Knight d5. Knight d5 is an interesting move looking here. Kotkov played f5, which gets a question mark. C5 was my choice. I get a thumbs up. The bot calling for king to h8. And can you find white's move here? Pause the video because the next move was scored a brilliancy by chess.com. And the move is knight takes c7, double x glam. And it gets a double x glam because he's giving a knight for a pawn. But the point is the king is still exposed on the a2g8 diagonal. And I've told you this many times. When you're playing an f-pawn opening such as Kotkov has played, you want to get your king off of that diagonal and over onto h8. Queen takes the knight. And sure enough, uh, he didn't play bishop c4, which is what I expected, but he does give check on that diagonal. So it's still just as effective. In fact, perhaps more so because it super attacks the D man. Now the bot says, no, you should have gone ahead with the bishop. Wow, the eval bar lunges back to center. I overlooked something there as well then. Oh, it changed his mind. The eval bar just went back up. So here, king h8 is forced. Rook e8, unleashing his battery. Kutkov, miserably undeveloped. So much better than queen takes the pawn uh, that I mentioned before when I said queen d5. I said it, I, I suggested it was even better because it was super attacking this pawn, which I'm sure it's okay to take this pawn. It's just not nearly as good as rook e8. So if we take the pawn, let's see what the bot gives us. We do get a star from the annotator, but the eval bar lunges back towards center. Of course, it changed its mind a little bit ago. Maybe it'll change its mind again if we let it sit long enough. But anyway, surely here black would trade queens. And if he plays knight f6, I'll just take his rook. Anyway, the eval bar in the middle, clearly my ideas were not as good as Nizhmetinov's. Rook e8 gets the x-glam. 
and also gets the favor of the eval bar. Knight f6, rook takes rook, bishop takes rook, bishop b2, pinning the knight, the knight's undefended. So bishop g7, and he'd love to get h5 in to get his king some breathing room. That might even turn the table for black. But here comes the second brilliancy. Bishop c4, double x glam. And the point is, you're sacrificing your queen, but it cannot be taken. Meanwhile, you're threatening rook e8 check, and he has to take, and then that's mate. So the knight cannot take the queen because that allows checkmate. The bishop being pinned by our bishop. And he cannot allow rook e8 check which after captures allows mate. So Kotkov defends the back rank with his rook by discovery. And the only square is bishop d7, e6 being triple attacked. And here, Bishop took the knight. You don't want to play rook e7 here. Although queen f7 might be a touch better here. Um, let's think this through. He played bishop takes knight, which should be winning, right? But even better is queen f7 but not rook e7. On queen f7, right, the rest should be pretty easy. And the point is, takes, takes, and mate. So black would have to defend the knight, and then I would have to take it with my bishop. And this is looking pretty good for white. If you take, then I'll take your bishop over here, not the queen. If you take with the queen, all of a sudden you're down a piece. So you take the bishop. Uh, back in this position, you don't want to play rook e7 either. On rook e7... Rook f8 defends everything. Bishop takes f6 was Nezhmedinov's choice. Bishop takes bishop. And now queen f7 attacking the bishop. In here, Kotkov blundered. He needed to play bishop g5. It's really the only move that allows this fight to go on. And even though white does have a decent advantage here, it's not quite decisive as of yet. Black is still fighting after bishop g5, but instead Kotkov defended the bishop with the queen. And that brings us to the position of today's daily puzzle. This is a blunder because the queen becomes overworked. And if you didn't pause at the beginning of the video, maybe you'd like to pause now. But it's the third brilliancy of the game. 
three brilliancies out of 25 moves is pretty amazing, if you ask me. But the point is that the queen on d8 is overworked. So the queen cannot defend both this bishop and the 8th rank. Which means that Nizhmedinov has an interference tactic, which he plays immediately. Rook e8 check, and black resigned because mate is unavoidable. I mean, we're not even celebrating that we're winning their queen for a rook, because we're technically not. Because technically he could take the rook. But if he does, his note that these pieces are of no value with an obstruction on e8. So on bishop takes rook, take your pick of checkmates. Do you want a kiss in the face magic square checkmate defended by your bishop? Or do you want queen f8 a little more distance for your checkmate? On the other hand, and, and by the way, after rook e8, Kotkov resigned. On the other hand, if queen takes the rook, then you have checkmate with queen takes the bishop. Bada bing, bada boom. I hope you enjoyed this little video on the background behind today's daily puzzle. Thanks, chess.com, for these daily puzzles from historical games. And until next time, have a great day and play some great chess. Bye now.